and John is going to give his first talk, which is, what are the drivers of urine production? John Ingram. Well, Joe, thank you very much. It's good to see you good again. Good to see you too. I was back uh, here the first time you invited me in March, which was for PerfWeb 23, and we touched on some of the similar things, but I think you're wise to expand upon all the things we touched on in that Perf, Perf Web 23. So um, Joe invited me to back and I very much appreciate that and honored to be here. And um, Joe, one of the things you asked me to see if I could speak on was, what are the drivers of urine production? So I hope to shed some light on, on that because it, as I looked into this topic more and more, it actually became more and more fascinating, but it also became more and more complex. And as I took the title that you had gave me, I thought to myself, after studying this uh, topic for uh, several weeks on end and, and the months that you uh, contacted me, I realized that it's really a delicate, delicate balance that, that uh, involves how much urine we actually produce. <clears throat> So real quick, we just do a quick review of renal anatomy, and here's the uh, cutaway of the, of the kidney, and the first thing I want to point out is something called the renal pelvis. This is really the structure of the kidney that gives it, it, gives it its support. It's the general central zone where the renal artery comes in and the renal vein and the ureter. There's also a renal nerve that, that is uh, not shown there that all comes into the central port portion of the kidney and uh, really gives the kidney its structure. And then you want to focus on the uh, vasculature of the kidney, which comes in, um, of course, like any vasculature, it breaks into smaller and smaller arteries, eventually feeding <clears throat> the most important area of the kidney probably for, for our talk tonight is the medulla, which is going to contain 1 to 1.5 million nephrons per kidney. And um, the nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney, as, as all of you probably know. As we look at the nephron real quick, we're just going to review it for a second. And you want to you want to look at the afferent arterial. This is something we're going to be referring to a little bit throughout the night. This is really the lead-in arterial into the glomerulus that, that begins the process of bringing blood into the nephron. And so as the, as the arterial, afferent arterial brings blood in, it goes through a vast network of capillaries uh, inside the glomerulus and it dumps a huge amount of plasma and plasma-like water into the convoluted tubules. The blood then exits the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Another thing you can make a note of for tonight's discussion, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And the blood then leaves there and then comes down and interplays with a vast network vast network of capillaries and convoluted tubules, which in this green box that I've outlined there is the uh, interplay that involves secretion or reabsorption and all the things that end up producing the uh, output, which is urine, that eventually we, we, uh, we discharge. So let's look at the kidneys a little bit more in depth. Um, of course, as I said, they're the primary functional organ of the renal system, and they're absolutely essential in our homeostatic function. They serve as the natural filter of the blood to remove waste. But they also regulate blood pressure, and primarily uh, in terms of volume, they regulate it by maintaining or discharging salt. And as you know, salt, sodium chloride goes, there goes water. So it's going to control salt and water balance, as well as a, a number of other things we're gonna discuss. They regulate the electrolytes, a, no, a large number of the electric lights, and maintain acid-base balance. It's important to uh, remember that a, a big function of the kidneys is also to maintain our acid-base balance. So they do regulate uh, a large number of the uh, electrolytes, sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, calcium, the nitrates, bicarbonate ion, and the excretion of the uh, hydrogen ion I put separate because we're going to focus on that, something people tend to forget about when it comes to the kidney. So they balance glucose and amino acids as well. They, they retrieve as much glucose as possible, rendering the urine virtually glucose free, except when you have a patient who's hyperglycemic. That is usually an unusual state, and you find glucose in the urine, usually it's an abnormal condition. And then it, um, the glutamine uptake helps maintain our acid-base homeostasis. Uh, it's a waste product, amino acids, glycine and citrulline are removed, um, but meta metabolically beneficial amino acids, serine and arginine are released into the circulation. So this helps as well maintain our acid base with these proteins that absorb uh, 
are, are hydrogen ion. They produce, uh, the kidneys also produce hormones like calcitrol, which is a active state of vitamin D, erythropoietin, and the enzyme renin, which we're gonna talk about. And all of these affect the renal and hematological and physiological processes in our system. So when you look at balancing urine production, I basically wanna focus this on three primary regulators, what I call regulators of urine production. You know, it's a, it's a delicate balance, as I said, and it's a tug of war in opposite directions between producing urine and limiting how much urine we produce, constantly going on in the body, and many, many factors interplaying on one side or the other. And then um, these regulators either stimulate or inhibit urine production. So I'm start off with the three primary regulators. And this is a take home slide. So you wanna make a note that one of the three primary regulators, aldosterone, very important. ADH, antidiuretic, antidiuretic hormone. Oh, this slide, and the autonomic nervous system. So let's focus on these three to get started. Oh, oh. Let's go back one. The back one? It's not going back, that's Here, okay. Let me see. Okay, so <clears throat> when you look at the three primary regulators, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone. I start off with this graph, and this graphic is gonna grow as the lecture goes on. You're gonna begin to see by the time we conclude all the delicate balance of why we produce, how much urine we produce, okay? So these are the three regulators. So let's look first at aldosterone. Aldosterone is produced by the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, also known, known as RAS, R-A-A-S. So we first start off with something called angiotensinogen. This is naturally secreted by the liver and angiotensinogen is a constantly uh, circulating within our uh, blood system, okay? Then when the, when the kidneys sense a drop in blood pressure, they release renin, okay? Renin then converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin one. This is gonna be a little bit of a domino effect till we get to the effect that we need. So renin is very important because it really starts the process and catalyzes angiotensinogen into angiotensin one. Angiotensin one is now circulating in the bloodstream and as it passes through the lungs, this is where the largest uh, concentration of ACE, angiotensin conversion enzyme exists. About 80% of it exists in our lungs. When the angiotensin tensin one comes in contact with ACE, it converts it into angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is what you really wanna focus on, on this slide, because once we get to this point of angiotensin II, angiotensin II now has direct powerful effects. It directly affects the adrenal glands. And by the way, as a side note, a high potassium, which is gonna play a hot, hot, an important role here in renal uh, and urine production, high potassium also directly affects the adrenal glands as well. And the angiotensin II stimulates the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is an antidiuretic. Make a note of that if, you, if, uh, if you're listening at home, because that's gonna become important. And aldosterone is an antidiuretic. Antidiuretic is gonna decrease urine output, which is going to hopefully increase our blood volume. But, and this is gonna result in an increased blood pressure. So remember when I first said, when the kidney senses a drop in blood pressure, it releases the renin. The end result of that is to stimulate aldosterone, which is an antidiuretic, decrease urine output, increase blood volume, and then the effect is, the end result, increased blood pressure. There's more to it than that, and we're gonna to get to that in a minute. So aldosterone is a hormone of the neuroendocrine system. It's the end product of the renin-aldosterone system, as I just demonstrated. But its main purpose is to regulate potassium levels. That's actually the main purpose of aldosterone. When I showed on that last slide that a high potassium will directly stimulate the adrenal gland to stimulate aldosterone, because that is really the main purpose of aldosterone. And in doing so, it's also going to be uh, aiding us in maintaining adequate blood pressure by controlling uh, the volume. So it's going to regulate our fluid volume of the blood, being an antidiuretic. It's also going to help regulate acid-base balance. The primary effects, it causes the kidneys to increase potassium excretion. That's really the main cause. In doing so, it's an antidiuretic, 
and it increases water reabsorption, okay? It causes the kidneys to increase uh, hydrogen excretion. So aldosterone's main purpose is to reduce excess potassium, and it's a consequence of this purpose that it's actually an antidiuretic, okay? Now let's talk about the second regulator, which is antidiuretic hormone, ADH. ADH is a hormone of the neuroendocrine system. It's also known as vasopressin. It's synthesized in the hypothalamus, hypothalamus and released from the pituitary gland. Now its main purpose is to regulate the osmolarity of the plasma, okay? It's also main, gonna maintain adequate blood pressure. And its primary effects as an antidiuretic is gonna increase water reabsorption as it's secreted, but it's also an arterial vasoconstrictor, raising the systemic vascular resistance. This is a pretty fast responder, and it's gonna actually uh, have its effect with just within a few minutes, okay? The third regulator of urine, primary regulator, is our autonomic, autonomic nervous system. Now, you can have the sympathetic response or you can have the parasympathetic response. When you have the sympathetic response, as you, most of you know, it's our flight or response, flight or fight response, right? So these are sympathetic nerve fibers. They innervate the renal arteries directly. Its main purpose is to increase heart rate and increase blood pressure. It's also gonna increase skeletal muscle blood flow. It's gonna dilate bronchial airways. This is all part of the fight or flight response. It's also gonna reduce internal organ blood flow and motility. The direct effects on the renal, though, is an antidiuretic. It stimulates aldosterone release, which I just mentioned to you, is also an antidiuretic. It's a renal arter artery arterial vasoconstrictor. It's going to decrease renal blood flow, and it's going to end up decreasing urine output. All this fits with the fight or flight response. On the opposite side, if it's a parasympathetic response, it's a rest and digest response. Easy way to remember it. Parasympathetic nerve fibers also innervate the renal arteries directly, and its main purpose basically is the opposite of what I just showed you. It's gonna decrease heart rate and blood pressure, decrease skeletal muscle blood flow, decrease our respiratory rate, increase our internal blood flow and motility, and the renal effects, it's gonna act as though it's a diuretic, reducing aldosterone release. It's gonna dilate the renal arterial, end up, end up increasing renal blood flow and increasing urine output. So now we have those three uh, regulators of urine, of urine production, but those have to be influenced by something. There has to be something that is telling each one of those to secrete more aldosterone or less, or to be parasympathetic or sympathetic, or to secrete more antidiuretic hormone or less. And that's where it really becomes important. So, these influencers, what I call influencers, are physiological factors that are gonna influence the regulators of urine production and cause them to either increase or decrease their impact over the kidney's ability to produce urine. So now our graph is growing. So we see our three powerful regulators, but what are the things that are gonna influence each one of these to increase its influence over the kidney or decrease? Well. If you've ever wondered, you know, let's think about it. We all drink, if you drink a, a large bottle of water, most of us know within five or 10 minutes, you're running to the restroom. Why is that? What has the body picked up on that's told the kidneys, we need to secrete a lot more of water? And why does it slow down and stop? What about blood pressure and blood volume? If our blood volume goes up or our blood pressure goes up, how does that send a signal to the, to the kidneys to increase or decrease urine output? If we have a high uh, hydrogen concentration, if we become acidemic, why does that tell the urine, uh, why does that tell the kidneys to increase or decrease urine output? Same thing with potassium. These two things are, are among the most powerful influences of urine production, so I isolated those on the talk tonight. And then some things that we bring in ourselves, things that we introduce to our system alcohol, caffeine, and we can take diuretics. So these are outside influences that we, can, uh, we, we, we decide to take. And how and why, when you drink caffeine, does it cause you to have an increase in your urine output and alcohol the same way, and diuretics. So these were the main most powerful influencers 
that I isolated for this talk tonight. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what a lot of these do. So the first one is osmolarity, right? This is when you drink water or become over, over hydrated or under hydrated. Well, this changes your osmolarity, right? So the hypothalamus is the thirst center of the body. That would be a take home note. There's osmoreceptors located in the hypothalamus. When the osmolarity changes, water diffuses in and out of these osmoreceptors. In other words, they'll expand or contract, right? If, if your water volume drops, your hydration becomes low, osmolarity increases due to the increase in the concentration of solutes. If the osmolarity increases, pituitary is stimulated to secrete antidiuretic hormone. Now, this is the biological sensation of thirst. All of us have felt thirsty. Why do we feel thirsty? Where is that sensation coming from? It's coming from the hypothalamus who has said the osmoreceptors are becoming shrunken, dehydrated, and it stimulates your urge to drink more fluid. The release of antidiuretic hormone secretion starts the antidiuretic events that reduce plasma osmolarity back to normal. So the increase in water volume will have the reverse effect. If water volume increases, osmolarity decreases due to the decrease in the concentration of solutes. If the osmolarity decreases, pituitary is not stimulated to, to secrete antidiuretic hormone. And the lack of antidiuretic hormone secretion promotes a diuretic event that increases plasma osmolarity back to normal. So let's take a look at this just as a simple diagram. You have the hypothalamus, and this is the thirst center of our bodies, and it's directly attached to the pituitary, the pituitary gland. These have osmoreceptors, okay, that I mentioned before are going to expand or contract according to our level of hydration. Okay, now, according to that, they may or may not stimulate antidiuretic hormone secretion into the blood, which will either increase or decrease our water retention. So, under dehydration, you see there that the osmoreceptors are shrunk, right? This will cause them, in, in a dehydration mode, to shrink. The stimulation is sent down to the pituitary gland to secrete antidiuretic hormone, which will be secreted, which will increase water retention and decrease urine output, right? So now let's look, let's look at another influence of the regulators, blood volume. If we look at our atrial stretch receptors, okay, these are located primarily in the left and right atria, but there's also about 20% of them are also located in the ventricles. We tend to focus on the atrium and think they're only there, but they're not. They're actually in the ventricles as well, but about 80% are in the, in the atria, so we're going to focus on that. So, and they're affected by a high or low blood volume. Blood volume is related to pressure, but let's just focus on uh, the primary fact that they're basically volume dependent because they will become stretched in a high volume state and they'll become less stretched or relaxed in a low volume state. And this is important to perfusion because, you know, we, we cannulate the right atrium, Joe, and I know you do, um, mm -hmm. this is a hot topic for you, that you like to, uh, uh, think about what happens to these atrial stretch receptors on bypass. We're going to be covering that a little bit tonight and a lot more tomorrow when we talk about cardiopulmonary mm -hmm. bypass. But when we look at the uh, atrial stretch receptors, what about in a high volume state? In a high volume state, we're going to, the st atrial stretch receptors believe that we are over volume overloaded. So it signals the hypothalamus to suppress antidiuretic hormone, which is going to increase urine output. It stimulates the parasympathetic system also, okay? This is gonna slow your heart rate, slow contractility, and this is gonna help to decrease the blood pressure, which is gonna help decrease some of the volume overload that you're having. But you're gonna release atrial natriuretic peptides, your ANP and BNP. This is what's really important about these stretch receptors. And these peptides directly uh, send a signal to decrease renin output, which is going to suppress aldosterone production. This is going to increase your output. It also directly, the vessel receptors are directly innervated with these ANP and BNP peptides. And they cause arterial vasodilatation, which makes sense, which is going to decrease blood pressure as well. Okay, so now let's look at low volume states. And for, you know, the sake of redundancy, it's basically the direct opposite of what I just said. But if you're, if you're hypovolemic, 
It's going to stimulate the hypothalamus to, to secrete antidiuretic hormone, decreasing your out, urine output. It's going to stimulate the sympathetic system, which is going to increase heart rate and contractility, increasing pressure. It's going to suspend the atrial nitriatic peptide secretion, which means it's going to increase renin, increase aldosterone, and decrease urine output. And the vessel receptors, which are directly affected, are going to uh, cause them to have arterial vasoconstriction, increasing blood pressure. Okay? Basically, shock. Mm -hmm. So, while volume and pressure are related, you could have opposites going on. And that's why I mentioned earlier, you could have, it's a tug of war and a delicate balance here. Because when it comes to pressure specifically, all of us have, have, have been taught in, in school that we have barrel, barrel receptors located in the, in the arch vessels, right? These are directly pressure sensitive, whereas the atrial uh, sensors were really stretched by volume. Now these are, like I said, these are located in the sinuses of the aortic arch and arch vessels. They're affected by high or low blood pressure. They also become stretched in high pressure straits, in, in, high, in high pressure situations, they become stretched or they contract or become relaxed in low pressure situations. So these baroreceptors in a high pressure state send a signal to the hypothalamus to inhib inhibit aldosterone, which is gonna increase urine output, stimulates parasympathetic system, which is gonna decrease heart rate and contractility, which is gonna directly decrease pressure Okay, it also decreases angiotensin II production, which is then gonna have the effect of vasodilatation, decreasing blood pressure. It's gonna send a signal directly to the kidneys to inhibit antidiuretic hormone, which is gonna increase urine output. Okay, so directly affecting uh, the exact uh, result that we want. In a high pressure state, it's gonna do several things to decrease that high pressure. But what if it's a low pressure state? Signals the hypothalamus to excrete aldosterone. This is going to decrease urine output. Stimulates the sympathetic system, which is going to increase heart rate and contractility, increasing blood pressure. It's going to increase angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstriction as well, increasing blood pressure. It's going to signal the kidneys to excrete antidiuretic hormone, which is going to decrease urine output. Okay? So now, let's look at acid-base balance, and specifically hydrogen levels. The kidneys and the body does not like to be acidotic. It, it does not, uh, cells do not function well in an acidotic environment. So in addition to the kidneys uh, role in this, it, it would be inappropriate to not uh, discuss what goes on before the kidneys get involved because we actually have buffer systems. We have the proteins, we have the hemoglobin, which is also a buffer the phosphates in our plasma, and the bicarbonate carbonic acid. We also have the respiratory system that's gonna play a role. And finally, as a last gap measure, the renal system gets involved. Okay, and we're gonna look at why this is real quick. But the buffer systems are proteins, primarily intracellular I'm referring to, and these are positively charged, charged groups that will bind with hydrogen ions and thus function as buffers. The hemoglobin's intracellular as well, inside the red blood cells. Now think about this for a minute. Your red blood cells are constantly taking in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide immediately inside the red blood cell shifts the bicarbonate uh, formula to the right, producing what? Producing hydrogen ion. Immediately the red cell becomes acidotic. Hemoglobin on its own is able to bind these excess hydrogen ions immediately, keeping the red cell from becoming too acidotic. In our plasma, the proteins by the way, at the top when I say intracellular, the proteins are also in the plasma, but the, the biggest influence is, is actually the phosphates. And these phosphates ions are able to immediately combine H2PO2 minus PO4 minus two, easily combines with hydrogen ions to form H2PO4. Um, then the bicarbonate carbonic acid in the plasma, which is a big one, the bicarbonate ions immediately combine HCO3 minus with H plus, pushing the bicarbonate uh, formula to the right, producing CO2 and water. So then you get, so the reason I mention that is because, you know, the, the system, your, your, your homeostatic system does not like being acidotic. So we have four primary systems in place that in, in, within seconds are gonna correct any acidosis that it can handle. 
And this can be easily overwhelmed, by the way. But this is why if you drink a 32-ounce big gulp of Diet Coke, very acidotic, and you have uh, you know, some, some jalapeno poppers as well, um, you don't become acidemic in your blood because you have these immediate systems that are going to be uh, addressing this acidosis. But if it becomes overwhelmed, your respiratory system is going to come into play, and that can start working within minutes and start uh, blowing off excess CO2, which I just showed what's going to move the bicarbonate formula back over. And then finally, and in a slower process, the renal system gets involved. So quickly looking at the respiratory system as an organ regulator, it's going to remove carbon dioxide via expiration, which is going to move the bicarbonate reaction back over to the left. And as you blow off more carbon dioxide, okay, it moves the, uh, it takes in more uh, hydrogen iron, moving the uh, reaction to the left, decreasing your acidosis. So causing the hydrogen ions to combine with the bicarbonate ion. So this is how the respiratory system aids us in controlling. So now let's get to why uh, more of the purpose of this lecture. If both of those systems uh, are still overwhelmed and you become acidotic, your renal system says, okay, I have to get involved. If the blood becomes acidotic, the kidneys increase the secretion of the hydrogen ions in the urine. Now remember what I showed in the beginning, the, uh, the glomerulus and the uh, tubules interplay with the, with the vasculature with all your secretion and your reabsorption are regulating uh, the level of the hydrogen ion. So it, the kidneys and the nephrons can easily adjust that and begin to take on more hydrogen ions. They also uh, can increase or, or secrete more bicarbonate ions. As a matter of routine, the kidney's doing this. So when it begins to see an acidotic state in your blood, it can take on more hydrogen ions and reabsorb back into the blood more bicarbonate ions. So it's really a two-punch powerful system. If the bl blood becomes basic, of course, the kidneys will decrease the secretion of hydrogen ions in the urine, and it'll decrease the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions. So when you become acidemic, uh, your, your kidneys are going to become very concerned about that and really begin to become a driver of our urine production. Another very powerful driver of urine most people forget about is a potassium level. Elevated potassium levels um, are monitored very closely by the adrenal gland. The body knows that elevated potassium levels, if they get too far out of hand, is directly going to directly start affecting how the heart functions. So it's very, very uh, sensitive to, to changes in potassium, especially on the high end. So serum potassium levels are the most potent stimulator of aldosterone secretion, mm. the most potent. The adrenal gland immediately stimulates aldosterone release in response to an elevated potassium. This is in regard if, regardless to whether you're hydrated, overhydrated. If you have a high potassium, the kidneys get involved to, to start reducing that. This is aldosterone's main purpose, is to reduce potassium. It's only a consequence of that function that it's actually an antidiuretic. Now let's look at things that we can take in ourselves. which uh, first let's look at diuretics. So diuretic drugs increase urine output by the kidney. We know this, but most diuretics, basically what most of them do is they inhibit the reabsorption of sodium by some means. And when you inhibit the reabsorption of sodium, water always follows sodium, okay? So you'll, you will excrete more water, basically uh, becoming the uh, purpose of the diuretic. What about when we drink alcohol? You ever heard that joke, I drank so much last night, why am I thirsty in the morning? Well, if you drink alcohol, the hypothalamus detects the blood levels of the ethanol. The ethanol, though, inhibits the pituitary's ability to secrete antidiuretic hormone. Without that ability to secrete the antidiuretic hormone, it causes the nephrons to retain water, okay? Consequently, the kidneys produce more urine. So obviously, the diuretic effect is you can drink all you want, but you're going to diurese more than what you take, took in, and you're dehydrated in the morning. Caffeine, what does caffeine do? Caffeine consumption has a well-known diuretic effect, but what it does, it vasodilates the renal afferent arterial, actually, which increases blood flow to the kidneys and increases the glomerular filtration rate. This re it also reduces the reabsorption of water and sodium. 
So that's going to increase your, your urine output. So now when we look at the graphic has grown now because we have our regulators there, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and the autonomic nervous system, but they're picking up their influences from the key drivers on the left. But wait, there's more. It doesn't end there, okay? There's more to the story. The kidneys have a self-regulation mechanisms of their own. The kidney maintains the electrolyte concentrations, osmolality, acid-base balance of the plasma within narrow limits that are compatible with effective cellular function. Fluid throw through the nephron must be kept within a narrow range for normal renal function in order not to compromise the ability of the nephron to maintain salt and water balance. So in other words, if the nephrons themselves would, were to allow themselves to be overly influenced by some of these uh, uh, regulators, they themselves would not be able to function normally. So that's why they try to maintain by, in addition to all these outside influences, the nephrons themselves must maintain a very narrow range of overproduction or underproduction. So in addition to all the influencers and regulators of urine production, the afferent arterial and the nephrons themselves have independent self-regulatory mechanisms to limit the amount of influence, to limit the amount of influence that these forces can exert. And, and these are called, so here I, I insert this into the, into the graph because at the last gap measure, all of these things are going on. We've taken in caffeine. We've got a high blood volume. We've overhydrated, whatever you want to throw into the mix. And it's sending these signals to the antidiuretics to secrete more or less, the autonomic nervous system. And right when it gets to the point of having its effect, the kidneys themselves say, hold on a second. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play a role here too and limit how much influence you guys are going to have on o over us. So... Renal blood flow. The kidneys are very effective at regulating the rate of blood flow over a wide range of blood pressures and blood influences, by the way. Blood pressure will decrease while sleeping and increasing while exercising, yet the glomerular filtration rate changes very little. Due to two internal autoregulatory mechanisms that operate independent of outside influence, and these are called, one, the myogenic mechanism, and number two, something called the tub tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. What is the myogenic mechanism? The afferent arterial of every individual nephron uses myogenic mechanism to self-regulate the blood flow entering the glomerulus. What does that mean? The myogenic mechanism is how arterials react to an increase or decrease of blood pressure to keep the blood flow within the blood vessel constant or as constant as possible. How does it do that? Well, so what it is, it's a counter reaction initiated by the myocytes themselves in the walls of the afferent arterial in a response to outside stimulus. They're most active in the afferent arterial, arterial that supplies the glomerulus. So if blood pressure increases, right, the smooth muscle snells inside the arterial are stretched, right, and they respond by resisting and by contracting back to where they to where they prefer to be. This results in actually very little change in flow, right? You understand what I'm saying? If the blood pressure increases, that forces them to widen. They constrict back to keep the blood flow back to as normal as possible. When the blood pressure drops, the smooth cells relax to lower resistance, allowing, again, a more continued even flow of blood. What's the tub tubular glomerular feedback system? Well, this is a feedback mechanism whereby there's something called maculodensa cells in the convoluted tubules that react to the osmolarity of the urine by either dilating or constricting the afferent arterial. So <clears throat> while, the arter while the afferent arterials themselves are, are, are sensitive to changes in blood pressure, down the, down the line, these maculodensa cells, they're looking at osmolarity. Osmolarity is important because that's telling you if you're overhydrated right, or dehydrated. So depending on the osmolarity, these macular dental cells are going to send a signal directly back to the afferent arterial to either dilate or constrict. So looking at this in, in, uh, in detail, it's a counter reaction initiated by the cells, the macular dental cells, and the convoluted tubules in response to urine osmolarity. They're most active, I said, in the afferent arterial that supplies the glomerulus. So these macular dental cells 
react to an increase or decrease in osmolarity of the urine by dilating or constricting the afferent arterial. A higher osmolarity activates the cells to release ATP and adenosine, and we can talk about that later, but the effect of that is to actually constrict the afferent arterial, which slows renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate. And I'll just stop to say for a minute, a lot of people say, well, adenosine is a vasodilator. It is, but in the afferent arterial, it's a vasoconstrictor. It does vasodilate the efferent arterial, though. Mm -hmm. So lower osmolarity filtrate activates these same cells to decrease the ATP and adenosine, which will then actually result in dilating the afferent arterial and increasing glomerular filtrate. So when you look at the whole complete picture, and now you've inserted the renal self-regulation aspect of it, you can see that all of these things are going on in a, in a, in a very delicate tug of war which the end result is how much urine we actually uh, produce, okay? And this is really the conclusion slide. Um, you know, you could probably have dedicated uh, uh, a year of your life studying or more uh, any aspect of, of the effects of this and how it really goes on down on the nephron level. You know, mm -hmm. there's so much going on here. So well, people do. Yeah, absolutely. Pe people do. And, you know, I, I, there's a lot of takeaway messages here that I that I see. Um, first of all, it, it is highly complex. Mm -hmm. You know, the, and I, I've said it how many times, you know, over the course of my career, the kidney <clears throat> is is one of the most underappreciated organs there are. But, you know, the people that spend so much time learning about this, um, you know, they, 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 they are so busy with chronic kidney disease mm -hmm. patients. You, uh, uh, the patients that we're seeing, you know, they, they don't see a nephrologist until the problem has become so bad that they now have a, an actual renal failure circumstance. And then they treat the symptom, but the process by which they got there is not really ever addressed. So how much of what we see is, is perhaps avoidable. Um, the other thing that I take away from this <clears throat> is that when we do heart surgery, whether it's even you know on pump more uh, perhaps confounding, but even off pump because you're affecting the blood pressure so much, how much, but specifically on pump, how much does how much do we really know or understand about the influences that has? Because it's a very unusual circumstance. Mm -hmm. You're emptying out the heart. Um, you're using continuous right. flow. You does that actually matter? You're, you know, we run mean pressures lower. You're hemodiluted. There's so many all of these factors. Can we bring Keith in if and, he's there and maybe he can join the discussion too? And just I didn't for even our, think about it. And just for our audience, Joe, tomorrow. We're talking about all of the things on bypass that affect urine output. Yeah, that's so going to be the very, things that you were just talking about. Important. So if if people are, are going to be watching tonight and then again tomorrow, this talk was done for normal physiology. Yes, and I mean you could have probably introduced a number of more things that I you know just didn't have time for because this is already very complex. Complex, but when you throw into the mix. Putting an atrial cannula in, completely confusing your atrial ne nephretic peptides, because I've never experienced a negative pressure, but that's what we're doing in the atrium. Then you have a non pulsatile flow, and the baroreceptors have never seen that either. And they're trying to increase blood pressure or decrease, and the atrial, and then you have, where does the sympathetic system come in? Then all of a sudden you have what some systems are sensing as an overhydration because we're diluted. The osmolarity gets changed. You probably have thrown every uh, and influence. And we're giving cardioplegia with huge amounts of which potassium. Which is huge potassium. Right. Then if you've done something to cause the patient to be acidotic. And then we're cooling then, them. Then we're giving them diuretics, maybe. Maybe you're and giving we're cooling them. them. And we're cooling them. So I think we are really, really understand as perfusionists. And then it's not a fault. But it's really not something we've ever spent a whole lot of time focused on. We're really on the outer fringes of understanding mm. what we're really doing to the kidney really on the outside mm. because, or, yeah. you know, do you know to them or how we're affecting all, them. All, all of, you know, yeah. we don't understand. I know I don't understand 
really, how they really, really, really work and what really they're sensitive to and what drives them. I hope I've shed some light on it tonight. Then you take this abnormal physiology, perfusion, ECMO, bypass, circuitry arrest, and you throw that into the mix and every one of these systems and every one of these influencers and regulators are now going, you know, hold the phone. We've got to do more urine output. We've got to vasoconstrict. We've got to vasodilate. It's no wonder that on bypass, I don't know that we even know what 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 normal urine output probably should be. You know if, what I mean? If any, yeah, we, we don't know. We, and until we don't know, we, we think That's a we very know. Good point. You know, and so I, I think by tomorrow, and this uh, perfweb uh, that you put together today and t tomorrow is so uh, consistent in its theme that I think people are going to be able to really um, think about more. Wow, you know, maybe I should read. And, and, and understand and try to understand more and more about what we're really doing with the kidney. And mm -hmm. believe me, I am far from an expert on this. And I feel like I barely scratched the surface on, well, I on think this. That's, and, that's, uh, that's, I mean, that's very humble of you, I think. But no, really. Keith, do you have any thoughts? Well, I really appreciate, uh, especially your last slide was, was great, your summary slide. And uh, I really appreciate you going through it very, very well. Um, I'm really looking forward to your next talk. But there's no doubt about it. it. It boils down to the microvascular perfusion. Um, the kidneys play an absolutely huge role. But uh, I'm looking really forward to your next talk, John. Yeah, thank you. And then John's next talk. But, uh, you know, so much. And of course, with everything that changes, you know, the, the, kid, the body itself. But I think since we're talking about the kidney, it's very adaptive. OK, so it sees an environment. You have a patient that's on a, a long term VAD. Well, that's continuous flow. And long term, those patients do just fine. They all don't go into renal failure. And they do. You know, they the, the, the uh, former vice president, Dick Cheney, he didn't go into renal failure and he had a VAD in for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But it's adaptive. On bypass, the problem is there's no time to adapt. It's sudden. It's su mm -hmm. and, and it changes <clears throat> throughout the procedure. Right. You have this environment, that environment. You can have multiple environments on bypass. Well, look, I, I, that was an, an absolutely incredible uh, talk, and I truly, truly enjoyed it. Uh, I hope everybody out there did, too.